I was discussing the subject of relationships with some friends a couple of weeks ago. Specifically the relationship between two people who have committed themselves to each other as life partners of some sort. Someone suggested that one of the advantages of couple relationships is that one can help the other in times of personal difficulty. The problem that remains, however, is that there are times when both are emotionally in need. To be prepared for such times so that we won't be defeated by them, it is essential that each of us find some way of nurturing ourselves back to strength emotionally. For myself, this often takes the form of writing in my journal or hiking to the top of a mountain. Still, there are times when I get so busy rushing around trying to meet all the deadlines for completion of various things that others have assigned for, to me to do that I lose track of my own chosen purposes and tasks. My time and energy are expended, and though others may be applauding, I feel as if I have accomplished nothing of value. I finally remembered what I too often forget, that I must pursue the things in which I believe, really pursue them, because when I live only for others, I begin to unconsciously look to others to fill needs and roles that they were neither designed nor created to ever fill. So take a deep breath, relax, and look that person in the mirror squarely in the eye with a smile. Then pursue your God-given destiny and know that it will be blessed. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, included in the New Testament section of the Bible, the Apostle Paul comments, When I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, and reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away childish things. One of the games it seems that children everywhere throughout history have played at some time or other is some form of king of the hill. Where I grew up, it was most often played in the wintertime, with the current and usually temporary sovereign standing on a mound of not yet melted snow. Everyone playing the game would simply try to push the reigning monarch from the summit and take his place. One of the problems our world has often struggled with is that various children have passed their teens, twenties, and even middle age years and still insist on playing King of the Hill. It is a child's game. While it is good to maintain within ourselves the spark of childhood, we must also reach for the maturity and wisdom that describe a true adult. It is time to stop playing King of the Hill. Instead, Let's join hands around the hill and work for the good of each and every one of us. Let us not dominate each other in a way that is inconsistent with any true kind of love. Rather, let's nurture one another and allow ourselves and those around us to grow in whatever way is appropriate to each one of us. And as we do so, may God bless us one and all. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. 
child, I was sent to Catholic school and taught by nuns to see the face of God in each person I would ever meet. I thus came to understand that God's face is not limited to certain facial features or a certain color of skin. I was privileged recently to visit the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City, and the man there questioned the appearance of my face because my appearance did not fit with his understanding of how spiritual people are required to look. How unfortunate that any of us could miss the honor of meeting God face to face simply because God might choose a face that is unacceptable to us. You see, in times and places that are appropriate, God might choose to use the face of any one of us. In the Old Testament section of the Bible, there is a story of a prophet named Balaam who was very spiritually sensitive, but who used his God-given sensitivity in selfish ways. Perhaps because no one else was available, God spoke to Balaam through the mouth of the donkey on which he was riding. If God should speak through someone, it is not an opportunity for pride, but rather for humility and awe and gratitude for being so honored that of all the possibilities, God would choose that person. In reflecting later on the man in the cathedral, I asked myself again why I choose to wear the clothes and face that I do when I am Sister Who. I began to realize that in becoming Sister Who, I'm not so much putting on special clothes and makeup as I'm putting on symbolism and metaphor distancing myself from who I am on a physical level so that, I be mo so that I may be more sensitive to God on a spiritual level. When I leave being Sister Who, I'm once again enveloped in expectations of typical behavior, patterns of action and reaction, and very physical and earthbound realities. As a gay man, I am for the most part excluded from institutionalized Christianity I'm not allowed to participate in other celebration of basic Christian, though not exclusively Christian, ideals. So I created my own celebration of symbolism, ritual, and metaphor. It is indeed a challenge to maintain spiritual realities within oneself while immersed in a world that leaves only the physical opposites of spirituality easily within reach. But that is where true vision must begin, learning to see spiritual life and truth within each physical person and thing, to respond with growth, and to be more abundantly alive than we ever thought possible. I didn't know that I was gay until I was 26 and a half years old. I lived in a world that discouraged me from making honest discoveries about myself, and it was only at that age that I finally moved to a new area where none of the past societal influences were present, at least not in the way they'd been present in the past. Part of the past were four years at a church college in the Midwestern part of the United States. I like to think that the numerous emotional and psychological scars that I received there have healed enough for me to discuss my experiences, if only in brief, 
without still holding unforgiveness in my heart. I'm still upset by a lot of the memories, but perhaps the time has come to share what I've been through in the hope that someone else will be helped in some way. Looking back, I think most of the problems stemmed from just about everyone at the school realizing that I'm gay while I had yet to discover that part of myself. I didn't understand why everyone treated me as they did, why they shunned me at times in the fullest sense of that word, why they refused to be honest with me or to answer my questions when I tried desperately to get to the bottom of what was happening all around me. After three and a half years of very subtle emotional abuse, I was obviously very emotionally overwrought. I felt like I was going to explode. In a brief time of confusion, I mentioned suicide and was therefore sent to a mental hospital by the school administration. It was either that or immediate and unexplainable expulsion from the school just months before graduation. I was only there about two days, however, because a thorough examination by the psychiatrist there determined that there was nothing wrong with me. The college administration still decided that I would either be immediately and unexplainably expelled or meet weekly with a psychologist approved by them. So I met with a psychologist every week until I graduated. But nothing was accomplished because the one question no one was willing to suggest that I ask myself was whether I might be gay. In any case, I did graduate and the abuse obviously stopped when I moved away from that environment. So what's the point? The point is simply that when I talk about growing emotionally and spiritually in spite of extremely oppressive memories and situations, I speak from my own experience. And when I suggest that we all need to be willing to forgive, I have not forgotten what I also need to forgive. And when I suggest that honesty is vital to long-term survival, I do have at least some idea of what of the cost involved. Somehow, in spite of it all, I know that God is still good, that I'm loved just as I am, and that a beautiful dream of what my life can be still remains for me. And I believe the same could be said for each and every one of you too. May God's love and mine abide with each of you always. Amen. In cooperating with God in the construction of our own lives, we must never slip into the fatalistic trap of thinking we're supposed to just put up with whatever life hands us. If there's any other way to respond, especially when the forces that confront us are destructive and violent, however subtle or obvious the evil may be. God has given us the ability to care about ourselves and those around us, the ability to choose, and usually in some way the ability to act. We must always look for ways, emotionally, verbally, and physically, to answer evil with good. and
Sister Who for letting me come in today and share my poem with you. It's called The Desiderata, and it's one of my uh, favorite poems from way back in the 60s. My mother and I were one day sitting trying to determine what that word means, desiderata, and we looked up and found the root word to be desiderate, kind of to wish. So I call this The Desiderata, A Wish for All People. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even the dull and ignorant, for they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons, for they are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble it is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. People strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, 
gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. Do not distress yourself with imaginings, for many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself, for you are a child of the universe, and no less than the trees and the stars, you have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive that to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations and the noisy confusion of life, make peace with yourself. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. A teenage girl makes headlines in the Seattle news for questioning religion in 1932 Frances Farmer was her name she had ideas in her head they tried to stop her crazy dreams she never heard a word they said when they told her paint by numbers color in the lines march in rhythm never out of time paint by numbers walk in single file learn the system conform to the style to hollywood she traveled to be an actress there and everyone was dazzled by her beauty and her flair but Francis wasn't satisfied with all the money and the fame. They tried to teach her all the rules, but she refused to play the game. Didn't want to paint by numbers, color in the lines, march in rhythm, never out of time paint by numbers walk in single file learn the system conform to the style but that's not how Picasso painted and that's not how Beethoven played they rearranged tradition and history was made that's not how Picasso painted that's not how Beethoven played They dared to be different And did it their own way Their own way They locked away poor Frances Told her she was insane And shocked her with the treatments that slowly killed her brain But her spirit lives with me And that is why I sing this song Cause when a brilliant mind is put away My senses tell me something's wrong When they tell you paint by numbers, color in the lines March in rhythm, never out of time Paint by numbers, walk in single file Learn the system, conform to the style Paint by numbers, color in the lines 
march in rhythm, never out of time. Paint by numbers, walk in single file. Learn the system, conform to the style. But that's not how Picasso painted.